All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Samuel Roberts, and I am a Dean's Ambassador for the UCR School of Public Policy. It is my distinct honor to welcome you all to today's special online seminar by our distinguished guest, California Assembly Member Jose Medina. Before the seminar, I would like to first go over the format for today's online event. I would first like to, uh, I will pose questions for the assembly member, then halfway through, I will open it up for a discussion with our student ambassador. We'll then devote the last portion of our event to a Q&A with the audience. If you have any questions you would like to pose for the Q&A section, I ask that you please do not send them via chat, but instead rather via the Q&A box below. You can submit your questions anytime throughout the seminar, and that way I will be able to pose your questions to this member directly through our audience Q&A. Now it is my honor to introduce our distinguished guest. Assembly member Jose Medina was elected in November 2012 to represent California's 61st Assembly District, which consists of Riverside, Moreno Valley, Harris, and Mead Valley. He currently serves as chair of the Assembly Committee on Higher Education. A former educator, Mr. Medina cares deeply about education and works to champion policies that improve the lives of students across the state. He believes that an educated workforce is critical to the success of California. His eagerness to assist students beyond the classroom motivated him to pursue public office. He served as a school board member on Yoruba United School District Board of Education and completed three successful terms on the Riverside Community College District Board of Trustees. Mr. Medina recognizes the critical role higher education plays in supporting jobs and opening up the doors for opportunity. First term in the assembly, Mr. Medina led the effort to ensure that the UCR School of Medicine received $15 million in ongoing funds through the state budget to train students for crucial jobs in the healthcare industry. In turn, those jobs will strengthen the region's economy as well as improve healthcare accessibility to the Inland Empire. Mr. Medina is a proud UC Riverside alumnus with a bachelor's degree in Latin American studies and a master's degree in history. Assembly member, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Sam. It, it's uh, a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry that I can't be, we can't all be together in person, but I guess that's the way things are now. Um, thank you, Sam, for the introduction. Um, always a pleasure to be with students and, uh, and especially UCR students. So thank you to, to all of you and the School of Public Policy uh, for inviting me here this morning. Great. All right. So let's start with this seminar. Um, so as we begin, I, we have a few questions for you, um, for you to answer about COVID-19 and how it's affecting both Riverside and the entire state. So my first question is information on the shelter in place orders can be very confusing. And I know I've had a lot of trouble understanding them myself. A lot of um, people say that um, they are changing um, pretty constantly. And it seems like the, each city and county is handling it differently. Can you tell us about how the state is handling the shelter in place orders or reopening and how is it different from Riverside County? Yeah, uh, Sam, I don't disagree with what you said that it is uh, at times very confusing. Uh, my wife who is a human uh, resource manager at her company uh, shared a little cartoon that showed someone saying, you know, that these are the last 31 changes that we've had in the in the past week. And so it, it can be, I'm sure it is uh, confusing for many people. Um, the governor, if you, you may have, you see him on, on television uh, almost on a daily basis, right? Um, has set up, uh, I think it is four different phases, four phases. Uh, for opening up California again. Um, all, all of those phases uh, using, uh, you know, health metrics measurements to when it is safe to open up California again. Right now, I believe we are in phase two uh, in Riverside County. And so that means that Riverside County is gradually being able to open up a curbside pickup, childcare, manufacturing, and logistics. Recently, the uh, Riverside County Board of Supervisors, if you've been watching, 
uh, voted to rescind their orders. And those were orders that, that the public health uh, director of Riverside County had put in place. And those included the mass, the social distancing, uh, the closing of schools. But the Board of Supervisors, after hours, I think it was like 12 hours on one day of hearing testimony, uh, voted, I, I think it was unanimously, or, or close to it, to rescind those orders. Myself, Congressman Takano, and Congressman Ruiz uh, all uh, sent in letters uh, advising against that. Uh, yesterday, I was watching the Riverside City Council and they voted to extend what they have uh, in place, which does include masks, uh, and to keep that in place for the next 30 days. So uh, I understand that there is confusion, but uh, I think the governor is uh, you know, doing a great job. Everyone I hear uh, tells me whether they are mostly, whether uh, irregardless of party, that they see the leadership that the governor has been uh, uh, demonstrating throughout this. Um, so four phases, we are now in phase two. And, and as, as you may, and it would be you know, good to hear, get your input uh, after, it does seem like uh, things are beginning to change. So we are in phase two of four phases in order to be able to open up again. Great, thank you so much for that answer. Um, it provides a lot more clarity for me and I hope the audience as well. Um, my next question for you, assembly member, is how are education institutions responding to the pandemic and how will higher education look in the future? Yeah, well, I, I think that's a great question, especially uh, uh, for, for this audience. Uh, yesterday we had, um, the third sub two committee meeting here in Sacramento on sub two is education and higher education. And as you may know, uh, CSU voted to not have classes in the fall in person. UC is, is waiting. UC, as I've, I, I spoke to President Napolitano actually yesterday, uh, I've been in touch with your chancellor, uh, our chancellor at UCR, Kim Wilcox, the chancellor at uh, UCLA, uh, they are working on different, uh, different contingency plans to, to look at what to do in the fall. And uh, President Napolitano shared with me that sometime in June, uh, they, they hope to be able to, to, to make that decision and, uh, and share whatever that decision may be. Uh, but as, as, as you know, um, it's not looking what, like what it has been before. And uh, I, UCLA students this morning had an article in I think the Daily Bruin and uh, looking at, at some of the risks that uh, having uh, you know, students back on campus would pose. So it may be quite a long time. It may be quite a long time. Who knows? I, I don't. And UC hasn't decided that we see uh, college life like it used to be or like it had been in the past. Uh, so there's certainly a lot of rethinking, you know, the distance learning uh, that you, I'm sure, all participated in um, has worked better for some than for others. Um, It'll be a while before we see a college and college life like it was. The dormitories, the classrooms, all of those things pose uh, danger uh, to, to uh, students coming together. So. And on that note, do you think um, that schools will continue to hold online classes even after the pandemic ends? Well, there had been, uh, the Governor Brown was certainly uh, uh, a, a po uh, proponent of that idea way back. You know, uh, Governor Brown, I remember, uh, had, had pushed a lot towards online for, for the UC 
as, as a means of actually cutting costs. Um, so, so it may have a, a lasting effect. It may very well, Sam. Um, and, and I'd be surprised if it doesn't. You know, one of the things that UC is talking about is hybrid, uh, whether, you know, some students could come back and some classes would be online or even mixing that up uh, between in-person classes and online classes. So, uh, yes, you know, I myself have taken my, I have taken, I'm in the middle of a political philosophy class that I am taking that's offered uh, online by Yale University. It's very different from anything else I've done. I had never taken an online class. You know, doing Zoom is different for me. I'd rather be there in person. Uh, so I, I think it's probably um, something that's gonna take uh, folks. Uh, I, I, I know friends of mine who are uh, teachers, community college, you know, it, it'll take time for uh, some professors probably to get more used to it uh, than others and to become more proficient at it. And I think that's some, some of the things that both CSU, UC and the community colleges is trying to look at. How do, how do they deliver online classes uh, better? Good, good question, Sam. Great, thank you so much. So um, the next question I have for you is, the governor's May budget revise was released last week and it does look pretty grim. What implications does this have for the entire state? Yep, right. As you know, it, there's a, a $54 billion deficit in the budget. Yesterday, as I said, where you see um, CSU and community colleges where we, we, we were um, in the, the budget committee uh, has already looking at 10% budget cut across the board. Cities like Riverside are also gonna experience uh, much less revenue, sales tax uh, hurting, the County Board of Supervisors also, so local, local uh, cities, uh, counties also hurting financially. Um, so a $54 billion deficit, you know, how we don't have the luxury of the, um, of Congress, of the federal government. We don't print money. We don't, we can't do uh, deficit spending. We have to pass a balanced budget where our revenues and our expenditures are, are in line. Um, so it's gonna mean, and we started the discussion yesterday um, cuts, uh, and, and I think in all categories, and there is some discussion of what, whether, what bonds might be able to be put on the ballot. Uh, are there any measures that, 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 that we would see that would try to increase revenue? Um, you know, the federal response, uh, is important. I think, uh, across the board. Uh, how much money do we get from uh, the federal government will also have an impact on the state budget. Definitely, definitely. So COVID-19 has also led to major changes in how elections will take place this year. And I'm wondering what impact do you think voting by mail will have on voter turnout? And how do you think this will shift the ways campaigns are operated? I think it was last week or two weeks ago, we had uh, special elections. Right? We had a congressional race out in the uh, Lan Lancaster, Valencia area to re uh, replace a congressperson in, in Congress. And then more locally, we had the, the uh, Senate special race out in the desert to uh, replace uh, Senator Jeff Stone. Both of those were vote by mail. Uh, elections where everyone got um, about every registered voter got a ballot in the mail. Um, I know in the congressional race, there were also uh, polling places that, that were open. And I expect that the November election where the governor has already said that it will 
every registered voter will get a vote by mail ballot. Uh, there would prop there. I would assume there will also be uh, polling places um, open on election day as well. So not only is the election going to be different, but you know we, we're looking at the general election only six months away, uh, November. Uh, the presidential election and the general election. So the way that uh, people campaign, I think is also gonna have to be much different. Like in this special election, and we'll see what it turns out to be going into November, where candidates weren't able, candidates nor their campaigns were able to knock on doors, meet with voters, that, that's gonna have quite an effect. On, on how people campaign. I think we're gonna have to see a lot more uh, online campaigning, uh, doing things like what we're doing now to talk to voters. Um, it, it, it's a big change from what we've done in the past. Great, so before we turn it over to our student ambassadors and hear their experiences, I do have one more question for you. And I'm wondering, um, we have recently seen an unprecedented reduction in carbon emissions during these past few months, with some reports uh, estimating a decline as, of as much as 17%. Do you think that this will be temporary or is California working on any legislation that will help us reduce our carbon emissions on a broader level, level after COVID-19? Well, we've seen lots of different changes. Uh, you know, all, I think all of them positive. Uh, in the environment where people are staying home, right? And the air, air quality is certainly one of them. I, I, I think you see, uh, you know, nature kind of reverting more to where it was before. Uh, maybe animals that you hadn't seen in some areas, uh, getting, you know, taking, being, having, having more freedom, uh, probably maybe in some areas being able to see the stars more. And I know across the globe, you know, mountains that had never been visible before are now visible. The, uh, the channels in Venice, you know, being clear. So definitely the impact of, of people on the environment has changed. Um, California has worked, as you said, very much in the direction of trying to uh, go in that direction. And we will continue to try to do that. But uh, you know, to answer your question, Sam, I think some of these uh, probably will only be temporary, you know, with the lack of traffic. Uh, that, that's had quite a different, uh, a positive impact. But, um, you know, it's to be seen when, when things uh, become more back to whatever normal was, uh, what the effects are. And this, Sam, also has, uh, and it's been talked about up here, economic uh, impact as well. You know, the transportation dollars come from uh, from from the uh, gasoline tax, and with people driving less, the revenue also goes down. On cap and trade, cap and trade that that uh, businesses use to to buy um, credits uh, also going down. So having positive effects on the environment, but having negative effects on the uh, financial picture of the state of California. Yeah, that's very interesting. I never um, really thought about how that would affect the uh, economy uh, per se. Um, but yeah, I would like to thank you so much for asking my question or answering my questions, Assembly Member Medina. Um, and at this time, I would now like to bring in my fellow and stu student ambassadors for a discussion joining us. We have Ima Joba, Daisy Gonzalez, Aaron Walter, and Eric Calderon. And um, I know you had some questions that you would like to pose for the ambassadors. Would you like to share those? Sure. And thank you, Sam, for the opportunity to, to hear from students. I, I, I want to learn as much as they do. So I, I, I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, ask uh, students to share their experiences with me uh, during this pandemic. So Sam, do you want me to go uh, one question at a time? Yes? Yeah, let's do that. All right, okay. Well, what I'd, I'd like to hear is just that. What, 
what has been your own personal experience uh, since leaving uh, UCR? When UCR closed and classes uh, were moved to online, and uh, I don't know, some students may have stayed in Riverside, others may have gone home. Uh, I know a few students stayed in the dorms. What has been your experience since classes uh, in person stopped at UCR? So let's start with Aaron Walter. Sammy's got a, a mute there. There we go. Sorry about that. It wouldn't let me unmute myself. <laughs> All right. Um, so for me, um, since leaving campus, you know, the pandemic has had some I mean, I think it's had some perks, but it's also had some negatives in regards to my educational experience. Um, the switch to virtual learning is a different skill set um, required by many teachers and students. It took myself at least some time to figure out how to balance working and continuing classes online. Even though now it is still, it's getting easier, but it's still a challenge to navigate. I'm used to being on the go and bouncing from one place to the, uh, the other and making um, remaining focused at least at each location. So being at home, while it does offer flexibility in terms of my schedule, it also does give rise to distractions and procrastination. You know, there's always like housework to do and whatnot. Um, with that, one positive takeaway from the pandemic for me is that I found that teaching myself has allowed me to develop patience, um, to really take a step back with myself and make sure that I understand and absorb the information over time, I've been able to also improve my time management skills and be more proactive in my educational experience, reaching out to professors and, you know, really learning more about campus resources and how to use them. Overall, the pandemic has added to my educational experience, at least in being able to teach myself to be more flexible, um, engage and understanding with others, um, especially with leaving campus. I've actually been bouncing back and forth between my home in Riverside County and uh, my other home in Anaheim where my family lives. So I'm still able to get some, I guess, social aspect in terms of I get to see my family, but I also get to see my roommates from time to time. But it is a vastly different experience from being on campus, you know, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and bouncing from one place to the other. Thank you, Eric. And next, I'll, um, I believe Daisy Gonzalez was going to answer. Okay. Yeah, so um, yeah, my, my experience, you know, uh, being back home is way different than being back on campus. So before all of this, I had a job on campus where, you know, I was a resident advisor for the dorms, specifically for first year students. And that was sort of, you know, that was my routine. My routine was to set programs for students, um, really immerse myself to interact with them and engage with them and see their own personal growth. And, you know, I had to make that, um, that sacrifice. I had to come back home just because um, I, my family wanted me back home and, um, and a lot of other uh, factors came into play as well. But yeah, and it's, it's, been, it's been a challenge. Um, my parents have never, I've always lived on campus. Um, so, you know, this is the first time my parents are actually seeing me, you know, interact um, at home while also balancing my academics. And that's been, a little bit of a challenge for them as well, trying to, you know, be flexible with everyone's schedule. Um, you know, I also have two little sisters who go to elementary school. I have an older brother who does attend college as well. I have two parents, right? So that's been, that's been a, a challenge, you know, trying to be flexible and trying to, again, interact with each other's schedules. But, you know, like Aaron said, it definitely has taught me a lot um, how to keep myself accountable, um, how to set up my own routine. In the beginning, it was challenging, you know, I thought that I could sleep in until 12, right? Because I didn't have classes Mondays, Wednesdays, or Fridays. I, you know, thought that I could get away with a lot of things, but no, setting a routine was really important for me, you know, wake up at nine, start my day early, you know, start my schoolwork um, and other, other tasks that I had to do. So, um, you know, it has taught me a lot on how to keep myself accountable and has put my time management skills to the test as well as I, as I was stating before. Um, but it has been a bit lonely, you know, I'm not exposed to that daily interaction that I was exposed to before, you know, 
I don't have access to those personal spaces where I was able to do my own thing. You know, I was able to have the library. I was able to, you know, have my own study space. You know, it's it's been a challenge trying to balance that. But I'm learning how to be patient, just like how Erin said, you know, um, you know, I'm learning how to, again, construct and follow a routine. And I think most importantly, I'm learning how to keep myself grounded in times like these. I think it can be really easy for us to fall into this overwhelming feeling of stress and anxiety, um, especially as students, you know. Um, so I'm learning, you know, how to keep myself grounded and learning new skills on, you know, the things that will keep me busy and the things that will, um, you know, get my day going. So it's been a challenge, but I think it's been an interesting challenge. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful for the future and I'm, I'm stay, trying to stay positive um, so we can return back on campus. But I know for right now, it's, it's something that we all need to adjust to, so. Are, are classes over for the year or they're still continuing right now? The, I think the they're, still, they're still continuing. We're in week eight. So we have uh, week eight. So we have three weeks plus finals week. So we're getting, we're nearing towards the end, but yeah. And Daisy, you were um, a, a dorm RA, correct? I, I, I was uh, also an RA at, at, at uh, A&I. &I. And so, you know, that, that paid uh, quite a bit for, you know, paid my room and board. And it, it actually way back then paid my tuition as well. Your pay has stayed in place, even though the dorms have been closed. Am I right? Yeah, so they did give us an option, um, uh, you know, whether we wanted to stay and keep our positions, but they weren't going to be paying us monthly anymore, or we could go back home. Um, okay. And so that was one of the sacrifices that I made, you know, having, you know, uh, not having my own personal space anymore. Um, but I decided to do that just because I knew that it was, I think it was time for me to come back home for a little bit and just sort of like restart, you know, it was going to be a little bit challenging trying to still balance some of that responsibility with everything else going on. So I decided to, to do that. But I, I have a couple of friends who did stay behind. They still have their jobs. Um, but, you know, um, the way that it's going right now, it was interesting. It's interesting seeing how, you know, really without uh, students and without student engagement, um, it's really challenging to be doing our jobs. Yeah. Well, thank you, Daisy. Mm -hmm. Great. And now we will all introduce Camila Pollard, who will answer the question as well. So Camila, leave. you are unmuted now. Thank you, Sam. My experience, um, well, since this whole pandemic, it's been, it's been different. It's taught me a lot of time management skills, a lot of flexibility with my schedule, but it's also been hard to focus sometimes being at home and you're a completely different environment staying inside all the time trying to focus in on your classes I've really enjoyed my classes this quarter and I think that's really put a drive in me to keep um, going with them and to put more effort and hard work towards them I'm used to being um, in a lot of discussion classes as well. So I think that's been really challenging for me personally because I'm used to being able to engage with other students and hearing their ideas about different topics um, going on within each class. So not having that discussion and um, interaction because most of my classes, um, they just record the lecture and then post it. So it makes it a little difficult for me to really be um, engaged and understand the material fully. Um, it's made me more of an independent learner than anything. Um, but it's just without the social interactions and being at home and confined, it's made it a little bit of a challenge. But I'm learning how to be more um, efficient with my time and um, more independent. Thank you. Great. So now I think we can move on to the second question. Okay. Uh, and, and some of the questions, uh, my second question, uh, you know, what has remote learning been like? I think you, you've uh, addressed and, and I was interested in, in challenges. Mm -hmm. And so let me, let me combine that question with, with the next question about how, how do you feel about moving towards next uh, academic year. So both of those, you know, what, what have been the challenges 
to remote learning and how do you feel about moving into uh, the next academic year? Great. All right. So let's start with Eric Calderon. Let me mute you real quick. Thank you so much. Um, so I think that, you know, the remote learning experience has been much different from a traditional classroom setting where, you know, we're used to entering an environment where we know, where we know we're here to learn and kind of be in an academic setting. Um, now that we have our, we're bringing our work space to our home space, I think some people have a hard time kind of distinguishing the two, whereas, you know, prior we would come home to kind of decompress Whereas now we're trying to find ways and trying to find little spaces in our homes to kind of um, get into that mindset and get into um, you know that academic preparedness. Um, I think we're seeing that some students are are have uh, varying differences. For myself, I mean, just like everyone else, with time it gets better. We're starting to adapt. I'm starting to incorporate more better practices as far as like uh, shutting off my phone, for example, because I know that can be a distraction or you know trying to be more stringent with my schedule surprisingly i'm actually really really busy i thought i was going to be oh, okay this quarter would be not as cr crazy but it's like now we're still having these long work days but we're just doing it from the comfort of our home um, i'm also seeing that sometimes it can be a little bit distracting i know when i'm back in in la for example you have you'll hear like the helicopter or the lawnmower or the siren or you'll you'll hear um, other people just coming by in and out some of us like live in small homes. When I go back home, I'm in a two bedroom house with six people. So it's like, how do you balance whether I can talk or not, whether I can share my screen or I mean, share my camera or not. I know some people might be insecure about like showing their background or their living situations. And again, some others have to be conscious about, you know, their surroundings, whether or not they can talk or be loud, or, you know, we have to request those around us to, you know, be quiet, which again is really, really difficult to be. And then in other instances, you just have no control over, you know, the, the sounds that are being emitted from, from our surroundings. So um, those are some kind of challenges that we're facing. I just think that, you know, we have a benefit from being on campus. I know a lot of people really relied on like the library, for example, to kind of get away and kind of have this quiet study space. So it's about trying to find a space at home where you can kind of mimic the environment that was offered on campus. We're also seeing that um, some people have varying accessibility, which can be a huge issue. Um, I, I'm really thankful that I have a computer and for the most part, it's pretty stable along with my internet connection, but I feel really sorry for some of my peers that you know might not have access to some kind of, uh, some of these electronic devices that we really rely on, such as an internet connection. You can see a variance when people with people's connection when they're trying to unmute themselves, for example. Um, or even again, some people not might have the accessibility when it comes to um, being able to turn on the web camera. Um, and we're also seeing that some people have, uh, now that they're back home, like the responsibilities have opened up where some of them are now caretakers, some of them are babysitters, some of them are trying to help out their family. And of course, the financial component to it as well, where um, unfortunately some people are struggling and they can't afford to, you know, to buy a computer or, you know, to continue to pay, paying the bills or, or even uh, when it comes to uh, paying for some of the course materials, for example, some people might have issues with that. So um, I think there's a, there's a lot of issues. And I think we can see a spectrum as far as um, some people might be struggling more so than others, depending on, on their access, for example, or, or the kind of their, their environment and the situation they're in. Um, but the great thing is that most people have been pretty um, compassionate and understanding with one another. I think we just have this, um, message being emitted from from our campus or our professors where they're also struggling to kind of adapt to this. I think we're all in this unprecedented situation. So I'm really happy that, you know, UCR has really tried to um, help us when it comes to um, extending the deadline, for example, to go from a pass to no pass. Um, they're also trying to do a lot of support. I think a lot of students are really happy that, you know, we were included in the CARE, um, the CARE Act. So that, that was really great as well. But I just think that this is gonna be a huge case study. Uh, I think many of us do have to adapt that this might be a new reality, that some of this might continue on. So I think looking forward to the future, I think we just need to continue to find best practices and perhaps do some additional trainings. Like after this quarter, maybe we can look back and try to 
cross compare some of the best practices from all these different professors and students. Uh, but it's definitely going to take some time to adjust. And I, and I just really want to say that some people are, are struggling and it might just depend on their situation. Um, but foreshadowing for the future, it looks like this might continue on for, for a minute. So it's about just finding a balance and finding as many accommodations, both with academics. We might see a dip in, in student success rates, for example, and it's about finding ways to um, alleviate some of the stress that they're having or, again, kind of implement some kind of resources so they're not trying to do everything on their, their phone, for example, that they actually have some kind of device that allows them to um, do all their schoolwork. So I think it's just gonna be a varying degree uh, in terms of how students respond to it. Um, but I just know that some, some folks are struggling more than others. And I think with time, we're continuing to adapt and find ways to, to you know, make, make the best of the situation. But I think this is every, everyone struggling with this and um, it's gonna be quite some time to solve all the issues. And it's not necessarily just a UCR issue or it's like everyone is trying to adapt to this new, this new normal in a way. Did this quarter begin online? I'm just trying to remember what the timing was. Yeah, so I think uh, week nine or week 10 of the winter is where it all kicked off. Our finals uh, last quarter were, were all online and then this entire quarter has been online as well. So and we got a little taste of it towards the tail end of the, of the winter quarter. Okay. And then this final quarter, all, all online. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, Eric, what you said uh, about, because one of the things I noticed about UCR is as soon as I would walk on campus, I, I could sense, I don't know what it was, you know, you would sense the seriousness of students and the engagement, you could feel it. I could mm -hmm. feel it from the moment I walked on, on onto the UCR campus. I could feel how engaged students were, you know, as I walked through, well, you know, I could, with the books open and, and, and that is hard to duplicate. Um, so I, I, I appreciate the challenges that you shared, Darren. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, great. And now I'd like to introduce Ima Joba. Um, he'll be answering the question as well. Yes, hello, thank you for the question. Um, with the challenges that I think I faced with online learning, I believe it was very difficult for me at start because I'm, me personally, I get very motivated when surrounded with other people and seeing, um, how they're interacting with the material and seeing them study. Um, and so not seeing that, it kind of was very unmotiv unmotivating and being like a senior that was coming to an end, um, it's very challenging knowing that I'm about to graduate this quarter and there's not really any closure that I felt with the material that I've been learning. I've been attending UCR um, since 2016. And so this is my fourth year. And so just knowing that the classes that I was taking, I was very excited when scheduling my classes, um, not having that closure of actually feeling like I graduated uh, because I wasn't on campus. Uh, I didn't get to have my last first day of school or um, walk through the halls of the Rivera Arts or just any of those last moments. Um, we just had our grad fair week online last week, I believe. And grad fair was something I was looking forward to for a very long time because it felt like it was an ending week where you get to buy your um, sashes, your all the materials that you're gonna use for graduation. And so it's very difficult. And I know a lot of people um, in my organizations, they feel that school isn't the main thing that they attend college and it's more part of the experience, um, organizations, interning. And so they are actually planning to um, take off their fall quarter just because they don't wanna lose any experiences. And so um, they don't enjoy the online learning. So I know some people enjoyed it, but some people absolutely don't like it. Um, and it's just professors kind of, for me personally, they went the easier route, such as I don't have midterms this whole quarter. They usually um, stay consistent with having quizzes each week just so we can stay more consistent. Um, but it's also that they feel for us about um, how challenging it is, but then also everything piles up and everyone has like many essays due at one time or just uh, many quizzes at the end of the week for all four of my classes. And so it's just hard to realize that I don't have work going on right now because I also used to work on campus. Um, and also being like also uh, as Daisy, a residential advisor at one of the apartments on campus and seeing that none of my residents are here um, because they, they have to kind of go home um, because of the situation. So I think it's 
um, hard on everyone depending on their situation and everything that I've been involved in as a fourth year, not having those last minute meetings or just um, events that you plan such as the formals or the, the um, ceremonies for the seniors that everyone looks forward to. So I think it's been a very um, weird challenge. And for the fall, I'm actually uh, planning to attend grad school at another university. Um, and it's Where? just- I'm Where? Planning, uh, in Washington, the uh, University of Washington, uh, uh. In HA program. And so it's weird realizing that a professional degree that I'm attaining, I won't be able to go through my first year um, in person. And I believe something very important about grad school is interacting with professors, faculty, and just other students because of the networking opportunities. And so it's just interesting to see um, how everything will be like for me, especially um, as it's only a two year program. And so we've had town hall meetings and They've said that it might be in person, but we just never know. But I'm glad that I was able to experience this at least this quarter. And um, I'm hoping for the best for graduation because of how my family has been looking forward to it being the first to graduate in my immediate family and also extended family. And um, yeah, it's just been a very interesting experience along the way. Well, I, I will share that when I graduated from UCR in 1974 with my bachelor's, I skipped graduation um, because I was going Peace Corps volunteer and uh, and had to miss my graduation. And uh, but I'm glad to hear that that you're moving on to the graduate program. Hopefully you'll get to get the uh, your your cape when you finish the graduate program at Washington. And, and that made up for me when I got my master's degree at UCR kind of made up for missing my, gra my graduation as an undergraduate. And, and, and I find very interesting what you were saying, describing how um, faculty are trying to evaluate your work, uh, you know, what you've learned uh, in this distance. And you said a lot of quizzes and, and, and a question. So a lot of the classes are not interactive. Someone mentioned that the professor, uh, you know, would take their, their, their lecture and that's what I'm doing. But none of the classes are interactive at UCR online. You don't yes. have even this kind of experience with, uh, with, with classmates in a class. No one's doing that. So I'm taking uh, four classes with my internship. That's the fifth class. And so out of the four classes, two of the four are recording their lectures. And so they record their lectures and post it in the beginning of the week. And then we have all week to review the le lecture. One of them is actually a podcast. And so the other two are more interactive, but students don't usually um, turn on their mics unless we're put into breakout rooms, but that's usually rare because of how it's a class of 60. And so there's a lot going on at one time, but some of them are just absolutely recorded and we just have to watch it on our own depending on our schedules. Yeah. Well, this is, it, it, this is a learning opportunity for me to hear. And, and it's important. I think it's important that, you know, we, we just, you know, way you were here in Sacramento and uh, it is good to hear and learn from, from you what your actual experiences are. Yeah. Great, so now I'll um, unmute Aaron and he can talk about his experiences with remote learning. Perfect, thank you, Sam. Yeah, um, for me, I'd say I kind of echo a lot of what Imad and uh, Eric have said. Um, for me, I faced you know some challenges moving to remote working. Um, a lot of those I think stem from you know being able to fully focus and retain information um, while classes have taken a step back in engagement and interactivity. Of course, there are some physical barriers that I've encountered. Um, I think probably the biggest one would be internet access or internet being spotty because I do jump from place to place. Um, where I am at currently, you know, my internet's usually great, but say for example, last week actually, I was, I actually missed a, a webinar because my internet went down and I was, you know, on the phone trying to figure all that out. But with that, you know, using technology and the online resources, it's, it's proven to be a double-edged sword because it's, I'm learning along the way, but because I'm learning along the way, it makes it just a little harder to retain that information that I need to learn, you know, for my courses, for my exams, and, and for my homework. Um, 
with that, course materials, at least for my courses this quarter, have become more accessible. And the university's transition in response to remote work and online resources has been robust. Um, the increased availability and access of materials does provide for me at least a sense of comfort and security, knowing that it's always there for me to you know, go back and review, to spend as much time as I need to, to independently kind of learn those skills. And of course, being able to work at any point and not having to deal with the chaos that sometimes comes with having to physically be somewhere, you know, having to a lot, you know, what's my drive time, you know, having to find parking, of course, saving a lot of gas um, at the moment. But with all of that, I think overall, I feel nervous, but at the same time, hopeful going into next year, I'm trying to retain uh, as much a positive outlook as possible. Um, but of course, you know, as discussions are ongoing, a lot remains uncertain. I know Yvonne and Eric are graduating this year. I'm set to graduate next year. Uh, and knowing that I could potentially miss my senior year is a, a tough pill to swallow. But of course, on the other hand, I don't want to rush into going back to school until it's reasonably safe, of course. Uh, I do also have concerns about how my education may be affected in the long term. You know, will I be prepared to enter the workforce or to take the next step in my educational career next year as compared to, let's say, if COVID didn't happen, if I was on campus and engaged and having the same experience I was having to prior to all this. But while this is uh, an uncertain time, I do find this is an opportunity for self-discovery, you know, um, as many of us had mentioned, to expand our flexibility and adaptability, and of course, you know, to value and spend more time with our families. It took me a while to adapt to my new routine and to remain productive, but I've learned to become stronger and being creative and finding new outlets and focusing on self-care, you know, mental health, I think, is something that's really important during this time that a lot of people may not be paying too much attention to. Uh, but with that, I do have a great support system. I've learned, you know, not to rush myself too much um, or doubt myself. You know, in times like these, I find that it's best um, to take things day by day, remain as positive and as hopeful for the future, while also, you know, looking at this experience as a learning opportunity. Um, I'm eager and hopeful that I'll, that things will continue to improve and that, you know, we'll be able to return to some sort of normalcy going into next year, whatever that may look like. Thank you, Aaron. Um, Sam, if, 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 if we probably got someone else to answer, but I, let me, I just want to react to, to me listening to all of you, and that is that I am impressed Aaron, and you asked the question about whether you will be prepared to meet the workforce. And I, I'm just impressed with, with you as a group of students, um, you're, how articulate you all are, um, you know, how, how you've adapted your, your patience. And, um, and, and, and it's just impressive of uh, your very um, good example, I'm sure, of UCR students. And, uh, and from what I've seen this morning, um, I would answer in the affirmative, Aaron, that I think you, you guys are gonna be prepared uh, to meet the workforce. Um, and that, you know, be married to a HR manager who does the interviewing and, and hearing what she looks for in people, you know, um, that she hired. And she actually just hired a couple of folks with uh, MBAs, um, you, got, you, you will all be well prepared. And, uh, and, and, and I think you're, you're, you're showing me too, you know, the dedication of the UCR faculty and, and I hope that continues. And I would assume that it does. Then looking at you, I think it does. Great. So before we go on to our uh, the next question you prepared, I want to just um, briefly mention to the audience, if you tuned in late or if you have any questions for the assembly member, um, please ask them now in the Q&A box. You can find that at the bottom of the screen. And after these next questions in the next few minutes, we will get to answering those questions. Well, Sam, maybe, yes, my last, my last question. Aaron, Aaron brought up a, a, a good, a good uh, question is, you know, what, what are your expectations for next year? If you had your brothers 
if 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 you were telling me what you know, and I think Aaron stated it well, uh, I, I hear the desire of going back to campus. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to hear how many of you hope that that's the 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 result or the decision of UC, and uh, how comfortable you know, will, will, would you, are you gonna feel going back uh, to campus uh, next year in, in the fall? And how, how do you think you would arrive at your decision? It's a few questions there. Cool, so I'll have uh, Camila answer that one. There we go. I just want to clarify the question uh, one more time before I answer. Yeah. So my question is, if if you if you would pick what next year looks like, what would that be? Uh, and and how uh, how will you feel if uh, if they say yes, uh, you know, classes are going to resume on campus? I think those are my two questions. How safe will you feel? And what would be you know, your, your, uh, what would you prefer for next year? Honestly, um, as much as the challenges have, we've all experienced being online, I believe we should have our safety first. So if we have to be online, then we have to be online. Um, even if I, <clears throat> I prefer being in school and in person, engaging with other students, um, having an open discussion, I think it's more important that we just stay inside um, a lot of the times, I know it's really difficult just for all of us here. Um, I wouldn't really feel safe if we were able to go back on campus if depending on the circumstances that um, arise, whether we have a vaccine or if it's safe, but if circumstances are still continuing the way they are um, with more um, rising in cases, then I just believe I'd feel safer being at home. Um, it's just, I'm honestly fortunate to be able to still work um, from campus because I do have an um, on-campus job similar to Maude and Daisy. But because of this, and I, I'm just really grateful for that. So that's why I feel more tied to being at home than in person next year. I'm a little bit nervous um, still seeing um, how things are going next quarter because being online, the, I'm taking more upper division classes. I'm only a second year student. I'll be going into my third year. So seeing that um, engaging with uh, more upper division classes has just been making me a lot more nervous. But I know a lot of the faculty, just to touch upon what Eric and what Aaron was saying before, they've been really flexible and they've been really supportive for all of the students. So I don't have a doubt to where next year is gonna be a, too much of a challenge and support of academic with our faculty and students, but maybe so so towards our mental health and with others with us just being confined um, at home. Is is there any concern, or what? How, how is uh, the change, you know, moving home? Um, and and I think the mental health is certainly an important topic. But just as far as grades you know i was a high school teacher and high schools um at least where i taught riverside unified uh, made the decision that they they the, the being out of the class was not going to hurt students so is there any effect one way or the other on uh, you know i know one one is what you've learned and how how much you've learned and that's you know, I think Aaron expressed that well. But my question is, your academic performance, uh, or, or or put it more bluntly, your grade, your G, your GPA. How's that? Your GPA is is there any concern one way or the other on that? With Come the on. classes I'm taking right now, I've actually been doing pretty well in it, surprisingly. But I think that's more so with the engagement um, of what my interest is. But in the future, I'm scared because going into upper divisions and maybe with other students who are taking math classes or science classes that need that in-person uh, learning experience to teach them how to do an equation 
or actually explain the formula, I really fear that's going to impact their GPA heavily. Well, you know, as a teacher, that was always my my own you know philosophy since I've been here in Sacramento that the most effective uh, way of teaching is certainly in person, and that you know, as a teacher, I know that I rely on the reaction of my students in their faces um, that I, you know, that is lost uh, when, when, when it's not in person. I um, appreciate what you've said. So it looks like we have, I know we have a few minutes left in this seminar um, and we do have one Q and A question from an, an attendee um, that I'll introduce to you assembly member. And that question is, do you agree with assembly members Gallagher's and Kylie's call from the legislature to review the executive orders of Governor Newsom, citing that the executive branch and legislative branch should play a co-equal part in reopening the state. That that that's the question, correct? From the state. Yes. Yeah. I smiled. I smiled because I read that I believe in the Sacramento Bee this morning as I was having breakfast, and uh, and both of those gentlemen are are, are good friends. Uh, Assembly Member Gallagher serves on sub two with me, the budget committee. And uh, so I smiled a little bit when I saw that. Um, you know, when the legislature went back to session, it, it, it was with the, uh, you know, with the belief that as all of you know, you know, we're a three, three branch form of government um, and that the legislative plays an important role. And in our absence that was missing. And so I, I am very happy to be back here. I think that you know the government uh, needs balance between the, the branches, between all three branches of government. And so we're playing an important role. But I disagree. I think that Mr. Kiley and Mr. Gallagher uh, are going a little overboard. And I think what they are saying, if I read it correctly and in the question, was they want to revoke the governor's uh, emergency power that was given them, given to the governor when we left. And I think in their statement, they've said that, that he has abused their, the government's power or the governor's po emergency power. And, you know, as you watch the news and as I've been here in Sacramento and you see the protests uh, at the Capitol, which there's been a lot of, or in Orange County, I disagree with, you know, a lot of that sentiment with, uh, you know, that it is a, a attack on our liberties to, to have to wear masks or that it is a attack on our liberties on the orders to stay home. So I disagree to answer the question. I disagree with uh, Mr. Kiley and Mr. Gallagher in, 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 in asking to revoke uh, the emergency powers from the governor. Thank you so much. So unfortunately, we do only have about a minute left, and that is all the time we have for questions. But I would once again like to thank you so much, Assembly Member Jose Medina, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us for this discussion. I'd also like to thank the sorry about that. Um, I'd also like to thank the student ambassadors as well for participating in the discussion. And thank you for uh, everyone who has attended the webinar series. You can learn more about the UCR School of Public Policy Seminar Series at spp.ucr.edu. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for having me here this morning. Of course. And to everybody watching, I hope you are staying happy and healthy. And thank you so much for attending once again. Have a good day. Thanks to all.